Good afternoon, Pastor Rob, this morning, or this afternoon. It's my 31st wedding anniversary, so I'm a little late getting started. I had to buy some nice things for my beautiful wife. I want to say thank you to all my Ranger brothers uh, who have reached out and subscribed, by the way, to uh, the channel. Say good morning to you. Thank you for your service. And Rangers lead the way. Second bat, best bat. <laughs> Anyway, guys, thank you guys, and thank you all for my friends that have been pushing out the YouTube channel. Thank you for all you that subscribe and patiently listen to what's going on. I, ho I hope you learned something here. I just want to share my experience as a pastor, and eventually I'll do some uh, interviews and, and political commentary, uh, hopefully uh, just to shed some light on things going on, but I uh, haven't gotten there yet because I haven't figured out how to use all the cameras and things that I've got, but we'll get there. But I just want to say thank you, everybody, for support and for um, subscribing to the channel. I try to put something out at least four to five times a week. And um, so today we're in, continue the study of Mark. We're in Mark chapter two. Let's say we'll go to, through verses 18 through 22. Um, we've been talking about Jesus, his teaching, uh, him uh, establishing, establishing his authority over the synagogue, over disease, over demons, all these things. Uh, so you worship a very powerful savior, a very capable savior. Uh, who uh, the devil is not an equal to. He is, uh, the devil is a created being, and Jesus is God in the flesh. So there's no comparison, no challenge to his authority or his power. Um, the devil is a defeated foe, and J Jesus reigns supreme. So today we're in Mark chapter 2, again, 18. It says, Now John's disciples, we're speaking of John the Baptist, um, and the Pharisees were fasting. So John's disciples are fasting. They're praying. What are they trying to do? What is fasting? Fasting is taking something very important to you, for example, and offering as a, as a quote-unquote sacrifice uh, of time or food or money or a hobby or project or something in order to get closer with God, to bring in God's presence a little stronger. Perhaps you fast for an important decision. It might be a college. It might be a career. It might be a spouse. It might be a career move. It might be a home purchase. could be anything. could be for a soul, somebody you're praying for, and you want to get closer to God and ask for special prayer for somebody who uh, hasn't been saved, somebody that needs healed. One of the things that I pray for and is constantly praying for, my brothers and sisters that served in the military, with the suicide rate being so high and me being a part of, unfortunately, four of those, that I have one survived, the other one's were not they were successful in what they wanted to do so we pray for your veterans pray for your military guys um that that are suffering uh, still fighting the war back home so um, please pray for them but so we fast to get closer to god fast for an answer fast for a decision say god i need your extra power i need this and that's what it is so here specifically is referring to the bridegroom i'm praying and fasting that i might get closer to the bridegroom who is jesus christ and so John's disciples were fasting. The Pharisees were fasting because that's what they do. That's their religiousness, by the way. The Pharisees are fasting, claiming to get close. So they're going through the motions, basically. They're not really, I would say, I can't judge them, but I would say, according to the scriptures, most Pharisees were not sincere. They were uh, fasting to be noticed by men, and they would walk around hungry. They would walk around distraught so that they might get attention for fasting. So but legitimate fasting is to get closer to Jesus Christ. So some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? And he gives a very legitimate answer. Basically, the reason for fasting is to get closer to God, to have an answer to the situation, just so you could get more inspiration from God, get you know more um, like a fill, a filling of the Holy Spirit from God by sacrificing something important. So why are they fasting, but your disciples aren't fasting? So they notice this. They're keeping score, kind of. People are watching this. And by the way, if you're a Christian, people are always watching you. Whether you, uh, if you confess to be a Christian, number one, people are watching you. Because now you stand out, and they have in their mind a stereotypical definition of what a Christian is. And people are, seeing that, are often watching you to see if you fulfill that stereotypical definition. Not fair, but it happens. Um, so... Even if you act like a Christian through work ethic, you're a good person, I'll pray for you, say nice things, you already stand out from the crowd in that aspect. So people are watching always as a believer, as parents, your children are watching you. They're modeling your lifestyles. So 
Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom, the bridegroom is him, the bridegroom is him, he is the, the, the bridegroom or the groom of the church. He is to be wed to the church in eternity. The church is his bride. So he says in um, Mark 2, 19, Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? I'm already here, guys. I'm with my disciples. They don't need to fast. They have my ear. They have my time. I'm here. I am present. They don't need to fast. I'm already here. So they cannot, Jesus continues, so long as they have him with them. You're praying and you're fasting to get closer to God. They don't need to pray and fast at this time because Jesus is currently present with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and that is when he is crucified, uh, and then he is he ascends in Acts chapter 1 uh, to heaven. So there is a, there will be a time when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day, they will fast. We're going to fast. God, he's gone. I want to be closer with you. I want to, So I deprive myself of things to be filled with Jesus Christ. I deprive myself, for example, most common is food. I, I, I deprive myself of food. I don't want to be filled with food. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to be filled with the presence of God. So I'm not, I'm not going to let even that space be occupied in my body because I want God to fill that part of my body. And by the way, emotions and food, uh, they can be a distraction to your relationship with God if you allow them to. But um, because food will drive you, hunger will drive you, emotions will drive you. And that's often they're used together, your belly with your emotions. So uh, when the bridegroom is taken away from them, on that day, they'll fast, and they do, and we do, and we do today. And so verse 21, here's a little type parable story uh, picture of, of a situation, and let's explain this, because sometimes this can be a very uh, misunderstood portion of Scripture. So in Mark chapter 2, verse 21, no one sews a patch of unshrunken cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. No one's going to sow a new message. The message is the gospel of Jesus Christ into the old law. The old fabric or the old garment is the old law, is the law. The new is the new covenant is the gospel, is the cross in, in the blood of Jesus Christ. So you can't take this old message and hope to marry it up with the, the, the new message of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel. So they coincide. Everything in the Old Testament points toward the, the New Testament. Everything in the Old Testament points toward the Messiah or the coming of the Messiah or the cross or the resurrection or the gospel. So it points toward and sets the foundation for what is coming, and that is the New Testament is the fulfillment of that. But when that old is in place, it must be taken away before the new can come in because it doesn't the law and the and the and grace are going to clash, and so that's what's happening here. No one sews a new patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Here comes a new message. I am the new covenant. The new covenant is in my blood. I am the gospel. I am the fulfillment of the old. And when the new comes, the old must be taken away. However, notice too. Also remember Matthew five seventeen. Jesus said, "I'm not coming to abolish the law. I'm coming to fulfill the law. And once the law is fulfilled for you." In my life, uh, and then on the cross, you can take that away. I fulfilled it. Now all you need to do is follow me, worship me, and, and, and follow me by grace. And you're saved by grace through faith, no longer through the observance of the law. So, no one sews a new a, a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. So the new cloth does not mesh with the old garment because the old has to be taken away. The new message comes in, the gospel of Jesus Christ, in fulfillment, however, of the old Testament. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old. They don't mesh. It'll make the tear worse. If you try to put them both together and make it work, it's not going to work. One has to replace the other. One is the forerunner of the other, and the other, which is the New Testament, the gospel, must take place of the Old Testament, although it finds its foundation in the old garment, quote-unquote. So, if he does, the new piece will pull away from the old. People are going to reject this message. You can't force it down their throats. They're going to follow the law. They're not going to understand. So it has to replace the Old Testament. You must be made, by the way. Then this is where, so that's the, the doctrine-ish type things. Now we're going to talk about the vessels. And so the vessels are the human beings. And so 
No one's, this is verse 21. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. I'm not going to try to marry the New Testament with the Old Testament. We're going to see where they line up and how one is the fulfillment of the other. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. So verse 22. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. So um, followers of the law are not going to accept or receive, for example, the Holy Spirit. Well, we must be made brand new. We're made brand new in the blood of Christ. We're made brand new at the cross. Uh, we are a new creation. Old things have passed away. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. You didn't get the Holy Spirit except for specific um, jobs that people needed to do back in the Old Testament. But every new believer in the New Testament through the cross, through the blood of Christ, is a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new through Jesus Christ. So we can't pour the Holy Spirit into these older law followers until they're converted through Jesus Christ. And then once we are converted through Jesus Christ, we can pour new wine into them. And that new wine, John chapter 2, uh, and that new wine is the Holy Spirit poured into our bodies where the Holy Spirit makes residence today because we're made brand new in Christ Jesus. So verse 22 of Mark chapter 2, And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. If you read Hebrews, Hebrews say chapters 9 and 10, for example, really give a good commentary on this. I'm not going to do that. I try to keep these short. But you are made brand new in this new covenant in Christ Jesus. The covenant today isn't through the law, the covenant and, and Abraham and Moses. The covenant today is through and in the blood of Christ Jesus. That's why we do communion, for example. We take the, the body as the bread that's broken for us, and the cup that we take with the wine or grape juice is the blood, symbolic of the blood of Christ. Um, and so... No one, this is the new covenant in the, in the blood of Jesus Christ. So you're new in Christ Jesus. And now he can pour new wine into your body without bursting. For this is just a symbolic, but that's what Jesus is getting. And they would have understood this, by the way. The bridegroom, the wedding, very significant. And we can get into, um, you know, Daniel and Revelation on the importance of the wedding. Mary being betrothed to, to to uh, Joseph, all these things. The wedding is very significant to them. It was a week-long celebration. A wedding was a big deal back in the day. And the bridegroom is here. You don't need to fast. I'm here. And, and a matter of fact, if the Pharisees had recognized that, what a different world we'd be living in. It would be, it would be incredible. And still to this day in Israel, less than 3% of the people in Israel still believe that Jesus Christ uh, is the Messiah. So they still fight that. So, Mark chapter 2, 18 to 23, is Jesus talking about fasting. He is identifying himself as the bridegroom. There's no need to fast when I am with you. I'm already with you. Now, obviously, uh, where two or three are gathered together, Jesus is in their midst. But if you want more of Jesus Christ, you just a little bit of sacrifice, modern day sacrifice today would be sacrifice something that's important to you to spend more time with Christ Jesus, to get more inspiration from him, maybe some direction, and to show how important it is to you that something means to you. So you fast, and he says, there's no need to fast when I'm with you. In this, in this case here specifically, he's walking with his disciples. And so the verses then in Mark chapter 2, 21 through 23, talk about the conflict between the law and the gospel. The, new, the old covenant, which is in the law, which is from Moses and Sinai, to the new covenant, which is in the blood of Christ Jesus. And again, read Hebrews 9 and 10 on that for further study. So um, that's uh, Mark chapter 2, 18 to 23. Just know this, that you are in Christ Jesus. You are brand new if you are in Christ Jesus. You have been made new. All things have been passed away. Your sins are gone. You can't even bring them up anymore. You could. You remember. I remember my sins. But when you bring your sins to God, he says, sorry, you're brand new. I don't even know what you're talking about. So you're brand new. Therefore, your His Holy Spirit can dwell within each one of us. It's in, and I always recommend, by the way, if you want to study that further, Hebrews uh, 9 and 10. But, but secondly, read Romans 8 every day. What a powerful portion of Scripture that talks about 
who we are in Christ Jesus, no condemnation, the love of Christ, and how the Holy Spirit operates within each believer. He has poured the new wine into the new creation in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, we can now operate in the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit indwells every believer in Christ Jesus. Number one, to say we belong to God. Number two, we're forgiven, and the Holy Spirit is there for us to function as believers in the power that we have through Jesus Christ. So have a great day. That's Mark chapter 2, 18 to 23. And uh, we'll see you all tomorrow.